This year, we, at Writers Week, actually got an award of our own. We were absolutely delighted and honoured to have been recently awarded the Irish Hospitality Awards Best Festival in Ireland 2011. And what makes it especially special is that it, we were nominated and voted for by the Irish public, so that meant a great deal to us. On behalf of us all, therefore, I'd like to, to sincerely thank the List Old Writers Week Committee. It's a testament to their commitment and imagination, supported by our outstanding office staff and fantastic festival managers, that their hard work is thus recognised. Sadly, one of our most committed and supportive committee members, within and without the festival, is here with us only in spirit this evening. Margaret Broderick was an exceptional woman, a huge support to so many of us, and a hard-working yet never self-promoting volunteer. Her loss has been a devastating blow. The last message we received from her offered her congratulations on this award. She was the kind of volunteer that you dream of, and on behalf of us all, I would like to dedicate this award to her memory. Thank you. He came down one morning, as you do, to let her know that he'd had a dream. <laughs> Almost, quote, as distinct as a vision of a cottage where it was well-being and firelight and talk of a marriage, and into the midst of that cottage there came an old woman in a long cloak who was, quote, Ireland herself, that Kathleen Nihulahan for whom so many songs have been sung, about whom so many stories have been told and for whose sake so many have gone to their death. Yeats's play Kathleen Nihulahan was first performed in Dublin in 1902, where it had an enormous impact and played to full houses. The only problem is that most of the play was not written by W.B. Yeats at all. It was written, in fact, by Lady Gregory. The idea belonged to Yeats and he wrote the chant at the end. But in a typescript of the play in the New York Public Library, where her papers are kept, Lady Gregory wrote in pencil, all this mine alone, <laughs> at the beginning of the manuscript. And then this with W-B-Y, meaning Yeats, towards the end. In a diary entry in 1925, Lady Gregory wrote that Yeats's failure to credit her as co-author of the play was rather hard on me. When she was encouraged by others to stake her claim on the play, she said she could not take from Yeats, quote, any part of what had proved, after all, his one real popular success. <laughs> Major Gregory also worked with Yeats on many of his other plays, contributing to them directly and abundantly, according to her biographer. This idea of self-suppression, self of not being acknowledged for her work, was something that had happened before with Lady Gregory. A year after her marriage to Sir William Gregory, who was 35 years her senior, she began a secret lo love affair with the young poet, Wilfred Scarwin Blunt. When their affair ended, she wrote 12 sonnets, called A Woman's Sonnets, and then asked Blunt to publish them under his own name in his next book of poems, which he did in January 1892. In his diary, the poet Scarwin Blunt wrote, I have remodeled Lady Gregory's 12 sonnets, which I heard from her a day or two she would like to see printed in the new book. The new book being 
his new book. They are really most touching and require little beyond strengthening here and there a phrase and altering a few recurrent rhymes. In the years after her husband's death in 1892, Lady Gregory set about learning Irish. She went to the Iron Islands on her own. She became one of the great translators from Irish into English. Perhaps something of the pain of losing her young poet she loved makes its way into that mixture of intensity and simplicity in her version of the 8th century poem, Donald Og. As uh, Noah's representative, that you've chosen an alien, I mean an American, <laughs> to uh, stand in for her um, to open the festival. I get the sense that it's already opened itself. Um, we've had singing and a, a lecture and some Irish and uh, However, I have to do the official duties. Um, I will say um, it is impressive to me that not only that uh, I was so uh, welcomed, and, and I don't think I'm a local now, but I'm working on it, and, uh, but also that the, uh, the, the uh, festival has been going on for almost 50 years. And uh, it's quite amazing that you have that kind of resistance and uh, uh, self-encouragement and uh, cooperation to keep something on its feet. It's 50 years is a long time not to have invited me. Um, <laughs> that was just a selfish thought. But, um, but I'm very glad to be here. And I've been, this is not my first rodeo or festival, and I've never quite seen uh, a festival that is, exudes such uh, welcoming, uh, good vibrations, and uh, pleasure to be here. And also, um, I didn't even know there was a North and South Cary, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you think of each other, but um, more of that later. So, um, without further ado, um, I have to read something I have to read here. Just, um, uh, Dear Billy, I hope you had a lovely day. Oh, that's, uh, that's from Eilish, just checking on me there. So, uh, uh, hang on to your seats and your hats and the rest of it. Your Excellency, Reverend Fathers, renowned guests, prize winners, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to declare the festival, where's the ribbon, where's the scissors, officially open. Respected writer has received accolades and awards galore, and we are honored that she has so graciously agreed to accept ours. The award itself has been designed, hand cut, formed and crafted by award-winning Eileen Moylan, a Listol native who creates jewellery and presentation pieces from her workshop in McCroom, County Cork. Mm -hmm. Brian's large body of work, it comprises of two arches, both hand cut with a leaf design, inspired by the cover of her novel, The Little Red Chairs. This design also brought to mind Eileen, to Eileen a quote by Edna. When anyone asks me about the Irish character, I say, look at the trees maimed, stark, and misshapen, but ferociously tenacious. The surround of these two silver forms are hand engraved with the titles of just some of Edna's work, showing how her writing continues to flow and inspire. In the words of President Michael D. Higgins, Edna O'Brien has been, and continues to be, a fearless teller of truths. Thank you to the Stowell Writers Group Committee for inviting me here tonight. I think one of the highlights of my year was spending the night at um, the Book Awards with the committee and being so enamoured at how shy and retiring they all are. <laughs> <laughs> um, this poem is called Seven Sugar Cube and it was written um, on receipts of news of the death of my father, which was very sudden when he was visiting my emigrant brother in Australia at the end of 2015. And I'd like to dedicate the poem to him. He loved the soul and everything it stood for, not for its literary prowess, but for its racing. Um, um, and I would like to dedicate it to him. The poem begins with a short epigraph which referred to a 1901 experiment in Massachusetts carried out by Dr. Duncan MacDougall. Dr. MacDougall was obsessed that the human soul had weight and was measurable. 
So he carried out an experiment on sick people who were about to die, weighed them immediately before death and weighed them after death, um, took the variables into consideration and he concluded that there was an average deficit of 21 grams. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the poem isn't as happy as I make out, but this is, um, this is the epigraph to the poem. Seven sugar cubes. When your mother phones to tell you that your father has died 10,000 miles away, visiting your emigrant brother in a different hemisphere, in a different season, do you wonder if your father's soul will be forever left in summer? Do you grapple with the journey home of the body of a man you have known since you were a body in your mother's body? Angel Hill by Michael Longley. Selected poems by Colette Bryce. On Balance by Sinead Morrissey. I would now like to call on Mr. Mark Piggott, who very kindly sponsors this award, to say a few words. Thank you. Now we have America. <laughs> I'm Mark Piggott. On behalf of my family, we're delighted to be celebrating the fifth year of the Piggott Poetry Prize. Over the years, we've had over 300 entries from poets, young and old, famous and unknown, distant and local. But they all have one important feature that binds them together. Every one of them is Irish. Now, if you're struggling with placing my accent, head down to the Dingle Peninsula, take a right, and travel 6,000 miles <laughs> until you reach Seattle, Washington. But over 120 years ago, my grandparents were born in Listowel, and I can thankfully say it's good to be home. <laughs> Um, well, I'm honored to be the service judge this year, a co-judge with uh, Durham Reese Jones, who can't be here, and I'm going to speak for her. Um, and I do want to thank Mark Pickett and his family for being uh, immensely generous for supporting this ongoing prize. Um, the three um, shortlisted poets you know are uh, Colette Rice, Michael Longley, and Sinead Morrissey. And I've written a uh, commendation or citation for each one of them, and uh, Derwin's had some input in that. And I hope uh, I'm going to read the three commendations, and I hope it doesn't sound like um, a combination of bad literary criticism and blurbing. But Sorry, I'm palpitating here a little bit. I really was not expecting that. Um, thank you so much. I am, I'm really delighted to, to receive this. Um, and seeing the extent of this crowd is a little bit daunting. Um, it's a far cry from the garret where we all toil away. And poetry begins in silence and in solitude, but it's born of a simple desire to communicate and the fact that my work has communicated with these two brilliant poets, judges, is heartening and encouraging to me. Um, I would like to congratulate my fellow shortlistees um, on their brilliant collection. And the one of them that's here tonight, the great Michael Longley, has long been a fixed star in my poetic permanent and um, just the very model of the lyric poet. So congratulations. Michael, on your wonderful book. The adjudicator was John McKenna. And the winner is David O'Donovan from Loch Gore, County Limerick, for his short story entitled Skinned Knees. <laughs> and presenting the award is Councillor John Sheehan Cahill of Kerry County Council. <laughs> 